Hi and welcome everyone. It's uh, it's really nice to see such a wonderful turnout once again. Um, Margin Lands is really special to me. Um, I think it was about 10 years ago uh, when Instagram was still new um, and I had taken a break from full-time publishing to just dabble in documentary photography, if <laughs> one can call it that, um, that I noticed uh, on the platform an unusually gifted photographer who was uh, documenting in the most captivating ways not only the beauty and the value of our environment, but also the slow violence um, that had been inflicted upon it over time. Um, it was uh, clear from her feet that even though photography was a main medium at the time, her work appealed to all the senses. She had been journeying across the country's uh, vulnerable landscapes, using all her senses to point out the treasures hidden in the cracks of our neglected, misunderstood natural habitats uh, that held stories and wisdom that could help us preserve what remains. There was this great understated power in her storytelling, something that deeply moved me and inspired me. Uh, whether it was her photos, her art, or her words, she's immensely talented, as, uh, as you know, all of you who are familiar with her work would know. Um, and I felt that many, many more of us needed to listen um, to what she was saying. So uh, when I returned to full-time publishing again, I wasted no time in reaching out to her and asking her to put a book together about her journeys across these margin lands. And since then, I think it's been five, six years, um, and, and a real privilege for me to, you know, to witness this book come together. Um, sometimes Aarti would travel across landscapes, spending months at a time in a place. She would return to some of these places and their people over and over again, um, listening, observing, pondering, and ultimately producing a host of um, wonderful essays, um, art, and photos that have culminated in her extraordinary debut. Uh, today, Aarti is an acclaimed uh, photo artist and writer and a nat National Geographic explorer, still doing what she had set out to do all those years ago, listening to our landscapes the way they hope to be heard and inspiring us to protect them. Um, Aarti, can I now ask you to go on stage and tell us a little more about the book? Thank you. Thank you, Tista. If it wasn't for Tista um, coming to me with an idea, I had not even thought of a book um, at the time. And uh, if it wasn't for her coming, none of us would have been here today. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thanks for showing your interest. Uh, thank you, Pan McMillan and Tista. Thank you, BIC and Ravi, for hosting me. And thank you, Meeta, my agent, for making uh, a bunch of this happen as well. OK, we're going to zoom all the way to the north, to the to the um, northernmost plateau of India, which is beyond the Himalayas. And so we're in the trans-Himalayan region and in the rain shadow region, where uh, this region gets very little rain, not, not even four inches of rain. This is Ladakh, the home to the Changpa herders and the home of glaciers. The glaciers are so important because this region depends upon the glaciers. It depends upon the uh, winter snow, which then melts and, um, the, and gives birth to streams. But once those streams, are, once the winter melt is gone, that's when the glaciers take over. And then the glaciers start melting, and they send down their waters to the meadows upon which the wildlife and the domestic life depends. So these meadows are the mainstay of life in Ladakh. The yak herders and the changpa herders, um, the ones who rear and, um, and, uh, and uh, use the, the pashmina from the goats to sell for their uh, income, uh, are, 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 use this as home, the whole of the Tibetan plateau. And um, it's also home to the sacred black-necked crane, so ab abundance of wildlife as well. Uh, call this place home. And uh, what's happening is uh, something not so good because, as we all know, uh, the glaciers are retreating, which means basically that the waters are melting later and later. And 
the glaciers in some places have retreated completely. So there's no water coming down, which means that there's no, no uh, meadows for all of these animals to feed on. And that is destroying the whole, um, the, the income and the livelihood and the mainstay of this region. Now, why is that happening? That's because the winter temperatures have risen almost one degree Celsius over the last 40 years alone. And that, of course, is climate change. And given that, what's happening is that when the glaciers, glacial melt does not come down, there is no water. And the apricot farmers, for example, who uh, are very famous, the apricots of, um, of Ladakh, five wonderful varieties of uh, apricots, um, they are just finding themselves out of business. And it's completely dry in spring, which is the main season during which they, um, they reap their, uh, their harvest. And there isn't any of that happening. And so um, we, or we find a huge loss of, uh, lo of, of a lifestyle, of a way of life in a region where people have hardly any carbon footprint. So these people, the barley farmers, for example, they're dry land farmers, and they have, have a different problem. What's happened to them is that rice from the rest of India floods the markets in Ladakh, which then puts the barley farmers out of business. So a variety of things happening in Ladakh that uh, is destroying the local economy. And what these people do then is they are trying to solve these problems themselves with the help of some people who are interested in keeping um, in survival, in survival in Ladakh, for example. And um, these people are coming up with solutions that are stop gaps, frankly, because uh, if the glaciers completely melt and we don't have any snow melt either, uh, then there is no water. And without water, there can be no life. Of course, there's much more detail in the book, but I'm going to take you to another part of our country just to show you that this isn't a one-off, right? This isn't something that is just a cherry-picked story. Um, we go now from the northernmost uh, part of India to the southernmost part of India. And here now we are in the southwesternmost uh, part of India, which is the Trivandrum district. And we find that Kerala is losing all of its beaches. There, um, Kerala is known for its beaches, but if you go there uh, to Trivandrum, what you find is that uh, this, for example, if you see the red line, is where the beach was in 2003, and you see the ingress of water, and uh, this is how the how the uh, uh, the sea looks now in 20 in 2020 actually, um, and the water has come in all that way so much so that we met people who used to have houses which were about five lanes uh, down in their village where you know five lanes away was the beach and the sea and uh, now the water is right at their doorstep it's in fact eating away their house and we met people who were living in half a house because the rest of their house had fallen in to the um, to the sea so that's happening and when you when you, if you take a boat and just go up the coast um, uh, of Trivandrum Here's what you'll see. You'll see people living at the edge, and you'll see the water right up there. They're sandbagging. They're trying. And even as we speak, uh, today is June, June 12th, and uh, the monsoon has just hit Kerala. And you're probably going to start seeing this come up in the newspaper, where you're going to hear of people losing their homes again. And why? Why is this happening? It's very easy to pin this on climate change and say, oh, yeah, sea levels are rising, but. But very often, that may not be the right way to look at things. Uh, it's, yes, sea levels are rising, and it may be exacerbating the issue. But there are things happening on ground which is very seldom talked about. And that is basically that we are doing things to the coastline which prevents the coast from building itself. Every year, this coast builds itself. The beaches build themselves. And that's because there's something called a longshore drift that comes up from the south to the north. But we are doing things to the coast. We are building um, you know, uh, obstructions along the coast, which 
which don't allow that longshore drift to come up. And, uh, and therefore, the beaches can't be rebuilt. So again, you know, it's very easy to pin, um, very quickly pin uh, things on, uh, on climate change. But let's step back. Let's take a minute and see what really is happening in our land. And then when you make those connections, uh, you see that maybe we are really shooting ourselves in the foot. And what happens when the beaches are lost? Of course, you know, tourism is huge in Kerala, and of course, that's going to be a huge fallout, but there's also more. People use those beaches, especially fishermen. How are you gonna push off your boat if you don't have a beach to push it off of? You know, if it's a rock or if it's just a sheer cliff, you're gonna lose your, um, you know, the way to push off uh, to, to go fishing. And fishing is a mainstay of so many people along the coast. And um, when it comes to uh, the slightly older fishermen, for example, they use this called the shore sign, uh, seine fishing, where they, they throw their um, uh, nets from the, sea it's, uh, from, the, from the beach itself and then they pull in stuff. And if you lose your beach, you lose this. So a lot of people are losing livelihood um, along our coast. And this is, again, not just uh, Kerala. If I'm using this as an example. Um, to, and and you're, there's nowhere, there's no recourse. This has been happening for a few years now. And um, every, every monsoon, you have more and more people, either homeless or without um, their livelihood. What happened? Now, what, what happened in Kerala uh, where, that made this, uh, uh, that exacerbated this issue is that somewhere slightly south of all these beaches that disappeared, uh, they built a jetty. They built um, a thing, and you'll see, if you can see the, this part, just look at this part, okay? This is a port that is being built, and I'll just head back one, and here you go. Um, so this is, uh, is 2003, and you don't see much. But then um, there, you see that, you see this thing, this breakwater that is coming out, jutting out into the sea, about 300 meters. Um, that's what happened. Even just that much is enough to stop the longshore, longshore drift from coming up. And all of the uh, beaches north uh, of this jetty then, all of these beaches, you'll see there aren't any beaches anymore, right? It's kind of, just see how it's eaten up? That's what's happening. And the whopping fact is that uh, Kerala has lost 63% of its beaches. 63% of Kerala's beaches are eroded or eroding, and it's, it's continuing. There's much more to the story because what we do to stem this also exacerbates it. So there's a lot of, you know, things going on there. Um, so this is just... Uh, you know, and, and here, here's, this is even more, this is 2020, 600, uh, 300 meters became 600 meters. And all of this is stone. So imagine now, where are you getting the stone from, right, to build these uh, breakwaters? It's all coming from somewhere, some quarries. And where are those quarries? Those quarries are in the Western Ghats. And if we all, you know, can take a little bit of leap of imagination, just imagine what's happening to the Western Ghats, right? So, uh, you know, Oftentimes, what we think may be the cause of uh, issues may not actually be the cause. And it helps us to stop, to uh, go deep, uh, go slow, and try and tease out what the proximal uh, cause may be. We are oftentimes just looking at only the symptom when really the problem lies, uh, lies elsewhere. Here's now, from, from the southernmost part, we're going to the northeast. We're going all the way to Arunachal Pradesh, to the, um, to the uh, almost to the China border. Um, again, a completely different issue, but yet one more, um, one more, you know, kind of nail in that coffin, the coffin that tells us that we are not really paying attention to the land. This is the lovely, lovely Siang River. If any of you has been here, you know what I'm talking about. Um, this is where the Siang meets the plains. But again, things are afoot. Uh, this is a river that comes from all the way from uh, almost uh, Lake Mansarovar. Uh, just a little south of that, there is a, a glacier called Angsi. So it comes all the way from China. It makes a U-turn and then enters India at Arunachal Pradesh. And then it flows down to uh, meet two other rivers in Assam and then become the massive Brahmaputra, right? And these rivers bring down very vital silt. It's fine silt, which is what uh, fertilizes the uh, plains, the flood plains and the food bowls of Assam. 
But they also do one more thing. There are boulders. There are a lot of boulders in the streams under which hide fish. These are the homes of fish, little fish. They're called small indigenous fish. And this is where the, the fish breed and they live. What we are doing is we are mining these boulders for road making, for dams, and for a variety of other construction. And when you, when you pick up a boulder like this, you can see the sheer size of these boulders, right? What you're doing is you're displacing what's under. And when you displace what's under, what happens? That all of that goes off into the river and it's carried by the river. Now that heavy sand is carried by the river. And uh, when the river slows down in Assam, what happens? Okay, for first, let me, let me uh, backtrack. So what are we using those, uh, those boulders for? Road building, and this is what road building will look like then. Um, so this is in um, 2014, when I started going to this region for the first time, this is what this region looks like. Uh, pay attention to this, uh, this hill here, this mountain. And this is what it looked like in 2021. And uh, it's massive, massive erosion, massive cutting of the, of the rock for uh, roads and landslides, landslips. And all of that is, goes down to the river and is carried by the river. And uh, another thing happens, when you move that boulder, every boulder you move, it changes the way the, the stream goes just a little bit. And if you move boulders enough, or if you remove boulders enough, the stream just completely, it speeds up and it changes course completely. And this is where the river used to flow. It doesn't flow anymore. This is the small, it's a small river called Simen. Um, it doesn't flow here anymore. Instead, what the, what the river did is it flowed through fields, through the food bowl, and that all that sand that was displaced came and was dumped on rich, rich paddy fields. And just how much sand was dumped? A JCP that was working on a road near the fields was buried. This is only the top of the JCB. So all the, the cabin, the car is completely buried. So that much sand, 10 feet of sand, and sand is inert. So imagine these fields completely covered with sand. There's nothing that can grow for years. The people I met said one decade and we'll not be able to grow anything for one decade. So imagine, imagine, imagine that's, what, that's the kind of stuff we're looking at. The other thing these, um, these uh, uh, farmers told me was that because the river speeds up through, where by, by removing the obstacles, removing the boulders, they can no longer judge. Once it rains in the uh, hills, their fathers taught them that it'll take six hours for the waters to come uh, towards them for the water to flow in the rainy season. But now it takes just one hour. One hour and the rains, rains that are falling in Arunachal reach Assam. The rivers reach Assam and this kind of thing happens. So imagine all of our uh, food bowls being buried and inert. And then most, most importantly, the people who work here can't work here anymore and have to move. They migrate. So a lot of the fallouts, the fishermen in Kerala, the Changpa herders in, um, in Ladakh, and a host of other issues, a bunch of things are there in the book, but the book just scratches the surface of what's going on in India. All these people are migrating. They're all migrating. In India, at any point in time, there is, depending upon who you ask, and you know, various numbers are thrown around, but somewhere between 200 million and 400 million people are on the move at any point in time. That is like almost, if you average it out, it's about the population of the United States on the move, imagine, right? And they're pinballing, they're constantly moving because everywhere there's something going on. They go for work, something happens there, they go for work. And so they're constantly pinballing all over India. What kind of um, lives are we, are we making possible for these people? These are usually men who are out migrate, the women and the children stay behind. And here we are, uh, with women, children not having any health care because their lands are destroyed and uh, no, no education. What is it that, what is our demographic dividend really coming to? Changing tracks. We are now heading west from the easternmost to the westernmost, to the Pakistan border and to the Thar Desert, right? We're, we're in June, right about now, somewhere where the place that I'm talking about is hitting about 42 Celsius, okay? It's like 
crazy hot, right? This is what it looks like. This, this is a part uh, that is very close to the Pakistan border. It's not Sum. Sum is a place that a lot of people have been to. That's, this is a little different, very less visited. Um, beautiful place with foxes and desert cats and um, wonderful wildlife. The great Indian bustard lives here. It's a beautiful area. This part, at this time, when I took, made this picture, we were two years into a drought. Two years, 22 months, and there had not been a drop of rain. And I was sitting with my friend, philosopher, guide, Chattar Singh, and here he is, sit, we were sitting on the top of one of these dunes, and here he is digging, digging up just six inches. And look what he brings up, moist sand. There's water under these dunes, he tells me. And we walk down, and this is what the well right below the dune looks like. It has water not three feet below, and every few meters there are these giving wells at the bottom of a dune after two months, uh, two years of drought. I mean, it just boggles the mind, right? We don't think of a desert as being, as holding a belly full of water. And here it is, and it's, this is what it is. And this, there are goats, because these, that's what uh, the pastoralists move through these areas, and this is their uh, lifeline. They pull up water. The more water you pull up, the more the well fills in, because it pulls from the sides. And this is ancient knowledge, right? These people have walked these, um, these lands for, for eons. And they know where to find the wells. They know, this, these are hand dug wells. They dig it with the hand and over just a few feet. And then there's water and they use it. And that's how they, they move on. Uh, because once you pull up the water, they allow the, the well to regenerate. And then they move on and then they dig another one and so on. So you know, it's, it's a, it's a self-sustaining, slow kind of life. Um, and rich, really rich. We are in grasslands. Did, did, can you imagine the tar is, is full of wildlife? And this is, these are the desert grasslands with demoisel cranes, visiting demoisel cranes in winter. And these are the people, they live, uh, when they move with their goats, they, they put up these temporary shelters called goals, and um, they live here. So these are, um, they call it their chaltahua sona, because these animals, the goats and the sheep, um, is what gives them livelihood, right? And um, all of this changes when there is one day of rain in the year. In this region, you get less than four inches of rain in a year, and most of that rain comes on maybe one day in the year. And on that day, when it rains, it changes the land completely. And these people are ready for it. It's not like they're sitting on their haunches, not doing anything. Before that, they have prepped the land so that they can conserve, they can catch this water, and they can make use of it for a whole entire cycle until the next year there is one um, day of rain, or not, maybe two years even, and still they have wells that are not running dry. And all of us in Bangalore know that even though we get flooded every monsoon, we still have water problems. These guys listen to the land. They know how the land slopes. They know where to build their wells. They know where to dig their lakes. Um, and they know how to, how to eat. This is where I'm standing on, when I took this picture, is a bund. But this is not just any lake that I'm looking at. It's something that is more than a lake. It's called a khadin. This is a water harvesting structure, yes. But it's also something that gives this after four months. They let the water seep into the land, and then they sow the land with wheat. There's no more irrigation after that, nothing. It's just that one day of rain and the collected water, which has seeped and saturated the land, which then gives them wheat. And these people, having resurrected this way of agriculture, which is 700 to 800 years old, have gone from being beggars and criminals to being rupee millionaires. And they're completely self-sufficient. All these villages, a whole community has resurrected itself in this district, the Jaisalmer district. But guess what? For the government, sitting in Delhi or in Jaipur, they think that all of this is what is called a wasteland. 68% of Jaisalmer district is deemed a wasteland to be better utilized. And so, all the things that they do to 
the desert actually makes, turns it from a living, breathing ecosystem to a dust bowl. And then we have all the usual problems. So in sum, what I want to say is I, I kind of took you from the north to the south and to the, from the east to the west. And in every place, the land itself is resilient. The, it knows how to resurrect itself, even in hard times. It knows how to um, sustain the people that live close to the land and understand it and listen to it. But if you have somebody imposing something against the innate nature of land, if you have someone who is sitting far away in an ivory tower and thinks they know things and makes plans for lands that are far away, what you can, what you'll get is a series of disasters. And unfortunately, the book is full, peppered with things where you sh if we had just listened, and many people actually bring that up when these plans are made. There are voices. There are voices saying, hey, this is not the right thing to do. This is the right thing to do. But they often fall on deaf ears. If only we could actually see, and not just with our eyes, but with our whole body, if we could actually see what is really there we may have been in a rather different place. Thank you. Anyway, um, just to give Aarti a chance to breathe a little bit and get some water and stuff. Think for a moment about how a story evolves in a newsroom. Somebody gets an idea or somebody is told something. And the person hearing thinks that that's a story, goes to the editor. Uh, if she's lucky, the editor says, fine, go do the story. So if you take that last story that you saw, the Thar, what would have happened is that the person would have gone there um, walked around, it's called getting a sense of place. Uh, walked around, seen the landscape, found the right people to talk to and asked them all the basic questions. How does water come over here? What do you do? How do you prep the land? Why is the water not uh, seeping into the soil? All the basic questions. Come back and file a story. That story is 10% observation and about 90% uh, reported speech. Most times you don't find that disclaimer there, that this is told to me, I didn't see it. Uh, what struck me about this desert story is, I remember when Aarti called and said, I'm off to Jaisalmer because somebody told me something. Came back after about, what, 10 days? 15. 15 days, yeah. Came back after about 15 days, told me, okay, these guys have found a way of mining ancient wisdom to be able to harvest rainwater. That's 18 millimeters of water, which they harvest and use for an entire year. And to do the story, you have to go back about five times. What? And she says, yeah, I have to go see them prep the land. Then I have to go just as the rains come in to see how the water flows in. Then I have to go again a month or so later to see how they use the water. And then I have to go in peak summer again to see what happens as the water gradually uh, gets used up. It, the thing is, that the, uh, the first way is how we usually see stories done. One trip, get all the information possible, then you come back. You've insisted, in, in this particular case, I know you did it on a shoestring. You've always, for as long as I've known you, you've insisted that you will immerse yourself in the story continuously, uh, visit the same place over and over again until you're sure that you've got the story. Uh, where did this come from? Where did this idea of this kind of slow journalism, it, it seems counterintuitive, particularly in these days, so. Well, uh, when I went there the first time and I was sitting with Chatar Singh in a bare room uh, and I asked him about this, I had heard from um, uh, Vishwanath about uh, Chatar Singh. Is Vishwanath here? I was hoping he would be anyway. Um, so I'd heard from him about Chatar Singh and I'd just gone on a whim to meet Chatar Singh and find out about this ancient uh, rainwater harvesting. And we were sitting in this room and Chatar Singh asked me, how much time do you have? 
And I had booked a one-way ticket. I had not booked my ticket back. So I told him, I don't know, I haven't booked my ticket back. And he was thrilled because he said, then I'll show you how it goes. And uh, of course, I did come back in 15 days. But I went back again because um, when you are in the presence of a man like Chhatar Singh, you do not hurry. And you do not do things halfway. Because this is the man's life. This is life in the desert. This is what people live by. And I guess the photographer in me really wanted to see how, how things change. Because I had gone in the peak of summer and the thought that this place would be full of water in the rains was so counterintuitive. It was like, really? I mean, this is the Thar Desert. I can see only sand. Um, so I wanted to, to really experience the whole cycle of life in uh, a year's uh, in a, a year in a year in the desert and so ended up going back I think almost uh, nine times in a year and uh, then a few more times after that because we've still stayed friends he, in fact he just called me the other day Chatar Singh just to find out how things are going and um, we are in touch because there have been things that have happened Prem you know when canals have dried up and uh, people who have depended upon the government's canals have come to Chatar Singh for water. So, you know, it's, this, is a, this is unfolding even as we speak, uh, this kind of wisdom and the, and the merits of listening to the wisdom. So I think uh, for me, there was no other way to do it. I had to live it with these people to the extent possible and, uh, and then tell the story at the end. So of course, yes, I was a complete pauper at the end of it, but uh, there was no other way. Yeah, and it shows in the story. I, um... You start the book with a quote from Catherine Wu. Uh, just wanted to read it out for you guys. Uh, Catherine Wu, who wrote Beyond the Beautiful Forevers, won a Pulitzer Prize for that, all of that. I don't try to fool myself that the stories of individuals are themselves arguments. I just believe that better arguments, maybe even better policies, get formulated when we know more about ordinary lives. And this book is about ordinary lives. The, so I just want to stay with Thar for a moment longer. The thing is, okay, your kind of deep reporting is meant to inform people about what is happening in various landscapes. What does society do with that information? What is is, is this actionable? Can 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 a Chatar Singh model be replicated elsewhere, for instance? Um, I would be very very to say that a Chatar Singh model could be replicated because the best way to do it is to listen to land wherever you are, and. Uh, the way it works in the desert may not work in Bangalore, for example. However, the fact that Bangalore gets almost two times as much rain as the water it uses and still has a water problem is something that we should be cognizant of. And if people who are unlettered, so to speak, uneducated, uh, have been able to solve the problem of drought in a place that is so hostile to living, and here we are with an abundance and we still have issues, uh, maybe it gives us pause then to take a leaf maybe out of that book and also start doing the right things by the land, not fill up our lakes. Um, you know, <laughs> what, what happened last year, for example, was appalling in uh, Belandur, right here, right, in this whole region. And um, it wouldn't have happened if we had listened to the land is what... Uh, is, is I think the uh, lesson we all have to learn. And it's something so hyper-local. What works in Belandur may not work in Vidyaranyapura, you know? It's not, one is not equal and you can't transplant things. But in just listening to the land where you are uh, and seeing what's right by that region um, will save us a lot of trouble. Interesting that you brought up listening to the land. This is, uh... Uh, the late David Foster Wallace once did a commencement speech and he started with a little story. He, he talked about an elderly fish uh, swimming in one direction and there are two, you know, generation next fish coming in the opposite direction. So the elderly fish says, uh, hey boys, how are you doing? How's the water? And the two young fish sort of, uh, you know, say hello and keep uh, going where they were going. They swim for a little bit and then one turns to the other and says, what the hell is water? And the thing that occurs is we've, we do, we've somehow forgotten that we are part of the environment and the environment is part of us. So nature has now become a tourist destination. It's a bucket list item 
uh, this weekend I want to go to, uh, you know, to enjoy nature up in the hills or by the sea or whatever it is. How does this disconnect actually happen and what are the consequences of this disconnect? Um, this uh, one uh, quote by Aldo Leopold that I love bringing up, uh, wherever I go actually, people are probably sick of hearing it. Uh, he said, uh, civilization has so cluttered the elemental man-earth relationship with gadgets and middlemen that we have, uh, that, it, that it has blurred, that that relationship has blurred. And um, I think that is the essence of what has happened uh, for us in the city. In fact, it's so, um, I don't think a lot of us even know about uh, where the, where water comes from, how it's coming, what whether Bangalore even has a river. I'm sure most of us here know. If you're here, you've come for this, you probably know. But uh, I mean, just you know, if you take the bigger picture, um, there is that. I think it's in our education. Mm -hmm. We and and I've seen it with you know my daughter, myself. The education that we got has nothing to do with the area that we're living in. In fact, when I, when I go to places in Arunachal Pradesh or even Thar, I meet a lot of people who, uh, who tell me that we've, told, we've sent our kids to school, but they're not teaching them anything about the place we're living in. They don't know how to come back and live in that space. Um, and can we do anything about that? And I think therein lies the problem. We have kind of removed ourselves from the land so much in terms of education, in terms of lifestyle, uh, we're cocooned. We go in a car when, you know, it's just as easy to walk. And um, and when you cocoon yourself, you are always putting one more degree of separation from, from what's around. And uh, I think that that fish is exactly us right now because um, this is the environment. And when people say environmentalist, I always smile. I'm like, really, shouldn't all of us be environmentalists? That is what we live with. That is us. We are it. But um, but I guess the specialization, the narrow field of vision, the kind of education has kind of made have put us at a remove from uh, what's around us and what we what we depend upon, what we stand on. And uh, I think until we make that connection again and we walk bare feet and let the wildflowers bloom, it's going to be a, a tough road ahead. And there seems to be no logical way of reversing that process. Uh, Unless we start with every one of us, right? We all just go back and, and, uh, and open our eyes. Uh, for me, in fact, it's so weird. Uh, there's one chapter in the book um, called Where the Wild Things Are, where until the lockdown happened, I had not noticed these uh, carpenter bees that came ob obviously every day to my garden before the lockdown even. And I learned a whole lot about a completely different world opened up to me. And I realized that they were nesting in my house. And uh, these are wonderful creatures. They're pollinators. They are what made my uh, cucumber a cucumber, you know, the flower a cucumber. And I didn't know any of that. And I thought myself observant and all of that, but it took staying there and just standing there doing nothing in my um, uh, nothing in my terrace to on my terrace to to notice this wonderful world. And so I wrote about it because I thought I have to include this. This is this is me discovering <laughs> the environment after you know kind of professing to be out you know. Yeah, this in is a your famous space. bamboo tree. What's that? This is the famous bamboo tree of yours. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it's not even, it's a bamboo stick which on which the cucurbit climbs, but there we go. <laughs> so. um, something that you showed uh, relating to Kerala and what you didn't show relating to Assam, for instance. Um, earlier this year, there was this essay that was written by Rebecca Solnit. And she pretty much sets out the theme of that essay in her first sentence when she says that every crisis that we go through is in some respects a storytelling crisis. So you talked about Kerala and you showed uh, evidence of how the, the beaches were disappearing. And it's not even over a long span of time, it's a matter of just a few years. Yep. And we were there, we saw yes. literally what... Frame was with me when we did the Kerala story. Yeah. yeah. Uh, 
one of the things that that happens with and and it goes to what uh, Solnit was talking about the Kerala story you mentioned part of it um beaches are getting eroded houses are getting damaged therefore you have to build walls to build the walls you have to bring the rock from the western ghats therefore what happens is you have landslides in the western ghats which you never used to have in areas like kalpata in uh, idiki for instance and then you have the other problem the problem of livelihoods uh, you can't launch your boat off a wall um you mentioned 63% erosion and this was about 3 years ago or 4 years ago that 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 survey was done and we saw with our eyes that it was happening pretty much at an incremental basis so mm-hmm. 63% is way outdated probably right? yeah uh also the same thing with say for instance assam every year they have floods mm-hmm. we do a story and the story goes there's floods in assam x amount of uh, hectares of land have been affected uh, so many people have had to move out of their homes there's been so much damage i don't know i mean while on that i can't imagine how a day after the flood hits a place somebody estimates the damage uh, it doesn't make any kind of sense but those are the stories you get and in your book you talk about the genesis of this problem so overall it's i don't know we are only seeing little bits and pieces of this this issue what occurs to me when i read the book was it's everywhere right and you talked about migrants so now you have migrants coming from one place to kerala finding that there is a problem um, we're talking of god's own country the poster child of god's own country is kovalam beach there is no beach in kovalam there isn't any which means all the people who made a living off of the beach a lot of them were migrants the ones who set up the uh, lounging chairs and and look after the foreign tourists and fetch them food tea whatever all of that is gone and now you you're stressed over here you go somewhere else and you find a different sort of stress over there how do we connect this up and how do we i think you wrote about this in your uh, epilogue where you said we are heading for a humanitarian disaster of catastrophic proportions can you sort of can you sort of draw a big picture for us um um i go back to uh, rebecca solnit's uh, thing about uh, it being a storytelling crisis and chatter singh actually said that before a crisis of drought and he was talking about drought of course um comes a crisis of imagination and i think that's exactly right in that the way we imagine um the story the way we imagine the the world around us um that needs a fundamental change and precisely because reporting on the symptoms doesn't help anyone if you have a fever that is your body telling you that there is something going on in your body the fever isn't the problem um i mean you have to control for the fever sure but uh there is something else going on which needs to be investigated and similarly the floods in assam assam is a flood plain the flood plain of the brahmaputra it does flood the floods are good that's what brings the silt that's what grows the plants the the paddy um so floods are good but what the floods that we are talking about are because of a completely different reason it's because of um, what the britishers did in building embankments which gave a false sense of security people built behind the embankments and these embankments have a lifespan of 25 years or so and it's been 70 years and we haven't mended them and so they're weak and of course the mighty brahmaputra swollen with monsoon freshet hits against it of course it's going to give way in places and there are villages behind the embankment and that gets washed away and then you have floods oh the river has devastated assam again the river does not devastate it's what we do to the river that devastates it and i think that what we do requires us to connect those dots back to pull back to see to take time to study history it's so important to study environmental history of india to see what's really happening but not just environmental history even the developmental history of india because we have done things the faraka barrage for example and i have an i have an updated story out in uh, emergence magazine the book unfortunately has an older version of it but uh, i mean it's astounding the kind of problems just that one barrage has done upstream and downstream for 1200 kilometers total you want to talk about that a little bit because 
um, if you haven't heard me talk about it already, I'm going to say it really quickly. So we built a barrage because the engineer's solution to desilting Calcutta's port was to divert the water from the Ganga and push it out through the port and keep the uh, silt at bay because the Ganga is one of the siltiest rivers on earth and it brings silt down every, every year all the time. But what ended up happening is that the, the engineers did not realize that this is a tidal delta. The tide brings in 160 times more silt than any river can push out. So of course this, the silt stayed and the barrage was completely useless for its original, the reason why it was built. But what ended up happening is that it held back silt, the riverbed rose, the left side, the, the right bank was, um, was rocks. So the riverbed rose, the river had no place to go because of rocks and it swung to the other side. And it has eroded hundreds and thousands of kilometers of land. And people have lost everything. If you go around Faraka, there is only devastation, upstream and downstream. But what else happened? The Hilsa, which swims up river to spawn, was stopped and it has collapsed a very lucrative fishery in India. And so that's gone. And there's, ton, there's one other very important thing. Because it holds back silt, the delta which is downstream, 400 kilometers downstream, cannot be built up. The delta is built on silt. So much so that the geographer William Van Schendel said that Bangladesh is nothing but the, uh, in, a, in a sense, the Himalayas flattened because it's the silt that comes down from the Himalayas that builds this delta up. But without that silt, the delta is sinking, the sea levels are rising. And then of course there's salt water ingress into Sundarbans and all those fields, all those people, there's so much salt. And again, there's massive out migration because of those kinds of things. So again, you know, something we do to the land, something in this case a river, we interrupt a river in a certain way and we cause a whole host of issues. And these issues are, it exacerbates the social milieu over there is so badly affected that there's smuggling cross border, there's, it's never ending. And those kinds of connections, it's this web, right? You kind of tweak one part of the web and you're going to disconnect a whole bunch of things. Everything gets affected. And, um, that's, and that is the story that I wish we had told many years ago. And one guy, Mr. Bhattacharjee tried to tell people and he was, banned, he was branded a, um, a spy. And so, of course, you know, you can't say anything against India. And same story goes on. This was the 70s. Now we're in the 2020s and it's still going on. You say anything against development, you're either anti-development or, you know. But the thing is, if you don't listen to the land, you are going to have problems. And so that story, those stories need to be told. Even though they're slow stories and they're slow burn over 50 years, it, is, it behooves us to tell those stories because they're important. I want to ask about a lot more of these issues that you've brought up in the book, but um, I want to do a slight segue into the personal. It was, <laughs> you, uh, sometime in 2007, when you decided to give up a lucrative career and get into, what, bankrupting yourself. Um, so when you look back, how's that journey been and and... A, do you regret any part of it? Is there any part of it that you would have done differently? Uh, what's, what's it been like? Um, I don't regret any of it at all, at all. Not one minute, not one second do I regret giving up the corporate life. I had a wonderful boss and a wonderful set of colleagues, one of whom is here. Uh, from and two of them are here sitting together at Intel um, and we had a blast and I think it was absolutely fun but uh, I do not regret any of it. Uh, I think this is what I always wanted to do. Um, about the bankruptcy part, I think uh, my husband is here and he's grinning but uh, yeah, so I think I would have been a little smarter. I know that these are important stories to, to tell, the ones that I told, but stories are everywhere even just Bangalore. And I feel, and this is what I tell youngsters who come up to me and say, you know, how do we do this? And I'm like, you know what, just put on a pair of walking shoes and walk around your neighborhood. And there are so many stories to be told there. And maybe that's what I would have maybe done slightly differently, concentrated on something that is, that would slightly be slightly um, less heavy on, on the wallet. But, um, but I think, you know, just seeing the connections and seeing how, uh, how, the land is, how it responds, 
um, has been so enriching uh, to me. Listening to the land just has been so enriching to me that there are no regrets. And hopefully somewhere down the road, um, you know, I will be able to, uh, to kind of also make it work uh, financially. Unfortunately, in India, funds for this kind of reporting are really hard to come by, but a huge shout out, for example, to um, Rohini Nilekani, who and who and people like her who are supporting these kinds of uh, efforts if it wasn't for her i wouldn't be able to do a lot of the traveling that i needed for this needed to do for this book so thank you rohini and uh, thank you for supporting thank you gautam for having taken my story to her um, and finding me that kind of uh, financial support because it's really hard the the media landscape in india a is not prepped for it and uh, b uh, has very few editors who have the appetite for this kind of patience uh, and long-term storytelling. The only editor I have found who had the appetite for such stories is sitting right next to me. And if it wasn't for him, I would not have been able to do things very early on. Thank you, Prem. So Sanat knows who's to, who to blame. <laughs> but uh, yeah, okay. I'm not going anywhere uh, more into that. But yeah, it is, a, it is a problem. And I know that you face that problem, just selling a story. Um, and being given, let's say, terms that don't even cover your airfare one day. No. They uh, do not pay for travel, and yeah. the, the and per word stories, thing is pittance. It yeah, doesn't exactly. cover anything, no. Unless you write for an international magazine, but then I want yeah. it to be you know, read in different languages in India and for us, right? So, Talking of language, one of the... Uh, things that you've talked about and uh, you'd written that originally for Peeply and then various other places is this, you talk about various kinds of laws, right? Laws of land, laws of livelihood, laws of uh, ancient ways of living. Uh, I thought one of your most eloquent pieces was about the laws of language. Um, there's that piece on the 40 names of clouds. Uh, you also brought up this uh, thing of people who you know, send their kids to school and they come back and they don't know how to live with the land. But I remember you telling me that they don't even know how to talk the language of the land. Mm -hmm. uh, what is that loss like? What I mean, you, you've seen it at both ends. You've seen people who've lost it and you've seen people who've held on to it. Um, there's an how, how big of a loss is it in mm, the first place? There's an excellent essay by uh, Barry Lopez called American Geographies. And if anybody's interested, I would really say go read that. Because he, he talks about the, and then, you know, there's also Rob McFarlane who's talked about uh, the loss of language. Both these people, Barry Lopez and, uh, and Rob McFarlane have both influenced. They, they showed me that after I first heard it from Chatar Singh, and then when I came back and I was researching this loss of language, I came across both these people, and I realized that this is not peculiar to India. Mm -hmm. It is not, uh, the, the, I think it is the Oxford Dictionary has done away with some very key um, pollination or something like that, some, for, for children, that there are so many words that are to do with the land that the dictionary has done away with, which are so important. And then it has introduced all these things that are more new age and uh, technology related in, instead. And it again goes back also to that uh, Leopold's uh, quote that um, it, it's muddied our relationship, right, with, uh, with the land. What ends up happening is that when you don't have the words uh, and you use the wrong words, like for example, wasteland, how many of us call the desert Banjar Zameen, right? How many of us call something that is not used deserted? I mean, even in our own metaphors, mm -hmm. right? The vulture, for example, is, is vile. The uh, wolf is, is a villain, right? Big bad wolf. It's when you say those things, that's how you think. And the same way, when you think in terms of the land, I was sitting with a shepherd and he said, this is our a legacy because in this land are 36 seeds which are waiting for that one rain and it's going to come up. When you lose the language that can describe something like that um, and you are at a remove, uh, you, lose, you lose tools for survival when something changes. You don't know anymore how to go back. You don't know what to do that can make things better. Whereas there are so many people in India who are living close to the land who do know that, who know how to go back. And not just in India. I met uh, people who are uh, American Indians in, um, 
uh, when I went for COP, COP uh, 21 in Paris, uh, they were saying that we have the ways, we know the crops to grow in certain places where there are droughts or where there's excessive rain. In fact, even in, um, in Bengal and Assam, there are varieties of, um, of paddy which can outshoot uh, rising flood water. But we have lost that variety. That variety is no longer there because in the Green Revolution, there was another variety which was high yielding and all of that, which is only this much and therefore gets completely flooded over and so on. But in our um, heritage, we do have those varieties of crops. We have that knowledge. We know where to plant it, when to plant it, how to plant it, how to take care of it. And when we lose the language to, to describe these things, we almost lose those survival skills. And, and that's the legacy. What, sorry? And the legacy. And the legacy, and the legacy. And that's what Chatar Singh was really worried about. He said, my son doesn't know how to read the clouds. He doesn't know how when the rain's going to come so that he knows what to do to prep for it. All of that is lost. Um, I want to turn, turn it over to the audience, but uh, one last question before I do that. Um, so a mutual friend reading your book, started reading your book and uh, messaged me saying that your voice in the book there's a wonderful harmonic to it. He likened it to uh, the way the ancient bards tell stories, the minstrels, even the manganiyars, for instance. Uh, how does, and this is more from a craft perspective, how do you find that voice? Where does that voice come from? Because it's not your natural voice, it seems more. I think you know this better than I do, Prem. Um, that when I sit down, I don't write very often, unfortunately I should, but I don't. But when I do sit down to write, it's like in one fell swoop. So it's almost like something has kind of taken over. Um, and uh, it really only comes from an experience that has moved me or something that I have listened to or something like that. If too much time has passed after that, I know I don't do very well. So I think it really is just the experience speaking through me. I don't know any better about the craft. I'm not a trained writer or anything. So um, I don't know exactly the answer, but I just think that it is the experience that speaks through, um, through the words that I use. But also the fact that I have had uh, wonderful guides, um, Paul Salopek's writing, for example. Uh, it's, it has coached me, it has trained me on how to see, and you have sent me wonderful things to read uh, along over the years, which has also kind of informed what I tend to, I know some that I don't like. They're very good writers and excellent people, and you know they're very highly acclaimed. But I know that that didn't quite gel with me. But there were some that just totally spoke to me. Barry Lopez, for example, um, Rob McFarlane as well. And uh, I think some of these people and reading that kind of stuff, it, it allowed me to to let that come out as well. Uh, I don't know how I have done. Um, you guys will be the judge of it. Uh, thank you so much for your interest. Um, but uh, yeah, that's what's out there right now. Yeah, just to add to that, there was this uh, there's this producer who um, has produced a whole lot of music albums by some of the greatest artists of all time, including Ray Charles. And there's a Rolling Stone interview where the uh, question asked was, how do you produce a Ray Charles? How do you produce Genius? And the producer's answer was, I don't produce Ray Charles, I get out of his way. And I think a lot of storytellers miss that that your job is not to write the story, your job is to understand the story and then get out of its way and let it tell itself, which is where I brought up the point about Aarti's voice. Um, questions from the audience? Yeah, lovely discussion. Um, Thank you. So uh, you know that I'm based in the Pacific Northwest now and over there, you know, we're bringing down dams. Um, largely to uh, revive salmon ecology, uh, but also to revive traditional ways, indigenous people's ways. And those uh, fights to bring down the dams are led by the indigenous people, but also require um, legislators to approve that. So can you say a little bit about what it's going to take in India for uh, power to be given to local people to actually own the policies? Wow, I don't even know. <laughs> I think the audience is all going to laugh. 
I don't know. I think the only way I will answer that is whenever I hear that such things are happening, like it happened in the Elva and now that it's happening in Klamath, um, I have what I call pol envy, political envy. Because I just love the fact that something like that is even possible. And I hope and dream that maybe something like that one day will be possible in India. Frankly, I don't even know what it'll take at this juncture. It'll take a revolution. It'll take a completely different way of thinking. And I'm hoping that maybe, I don't know if our generation can achieve it, but maybe the next generation, if there are a few people who get into um, policy making who have the, have the wherewithal to do something like this and to uh, see that uh, happen, um, that it'll happen in India too. But right now in India, we're going the completely opposite direction. We're building more dams and this, it's, I can't even begin to think that, frankly. But uh, yes, major to, envy. Yeah, to your question about how is this going to change or will, will this happen in India? Arti and I heard a funny story when we were doing the coastline uh, bit. Uh, this was related to a plan to build a port right next to a nuclear reactor, uh, next to the Kudangulam uh, nuclear plant. The locals protested. There was a lot of fuss. It, it got a communal color. The locals got together, resisted that, all of that. So this guy who told us the story, he says, uh, finally, when the protests got out of hand, the government decided that they had to do something about it. They called the representatives over for a meeting. And they said, look, what's your problem? Why are you objecting to a port being built here? And the guy who was leading the delegation, he's, he's a fisher. We met him um, in the middle of a fish auction, actually. He, he told the minister that, look, lots of reasons, but start with the basic one. It is that this area you are not permitted to build. Your own laws don't permit you to build because this is CRZ1. It's categorized as CRZ1. And the minister who's in charge of the coastline, fisheries, etc., turned around and said, what is a CRZ? Uh, you are expecting them to understand and formulate policy. <laughs> not That's in my generation, I don't think... In the next one, either. But that said, there are small victories of at least staying certain crazy bad ideas. Uh, there are uh, wonderful local uh, um, activism. There's lo wonderful local activism which is seeing small, small victories, but important victories which give hope. Um, so there is that, but it is going against the grain. It's always an uphill battle, and it's. You never know because it's just for now. It's always for now and then there's always yet another fight of the same thing. The exact same thing will come up again and again people will have to fight that same thing. So it's never that we're completely out of the woods. It's not like dams are coming down anytime soon. Thank you though for your question. Ma'am. Um, so you were saying you do this over the course of many months, even years. So how do you, how deeply do you get involved and when do you pull back? Isn't it hard to see something over the course of years and not be able to intervene or not really see any change? And um, if that does take any kind of emotional or mental toll, how do you then recoup both physically and emotionally? Um, this is one that I've frankly struggled with, Shalini. It's, uh, it's really hard. Um, especially going back to places and seeing that nothing changes and knowing that I can leave. That privilege weighs very heavily on me. And oftentimes when I come back, I come back to a very different lifestyle, right? It's not even just a, a it's, it's almost um, outlandish kind of lifestyle, the kind of lifestyle here in Bangalore. And, uh, I have I have struggled with it. There have been times when I have been uh, I've gone through a lot of despair, and uh, sometimes I wish that my own footprint was not what it is. And uh, uh, so it's it's hard. I don't know that I can I still do a good job of taking uh, you know of, of dealing with it well. But just one thing that I do make sure when I go back to these people is that I am not 
any beacon of hope for them. I, I make sure that I tell them that, that this is not some magic bullet where I'm going to publish something or it's going to come on TV and then everything is going to change for them. And uh, so, you know, I tell them that this is hard stuff and, you know, I'm going to try to keep, keep, the, keep beating at this, keep beating this drum, uh, but I don't know if anyone will hear it. So they know they're with me and it's become like kind of family I know that it's not my struggle. I can't say that uh, I, I go through the same thing with them. I don't. But uh, they know that I have the empathy. And uh, in that sense, I am with them. And at every point in time, I have tried to connect people who will either be able to be stronger together or who will learn from each other. Just as an example, um, after seeing what Chatar Singh does in the desert, and he's been kind of allowing community to take over and do it, he doesn't. He just goes and has like uh, tea time conversations with people, saying this is what you can do. And then they say, hey, I want a better life for myself. So they do it themselves. So this is not some NGO who's overseeing it and making people do it. They do it on their own, which is wonderful. And that's the exact same thing that was happening with Sonam Wangchuk in Ladakh, where the where the community said, hey, we don't have water. Those guys have water now because they did this. So now we want to do that. And so they saw YouTube videos and things like that. So when I went and met Sonam Wangchuk, I told him about how Chatar Singh was doing it. He actually flew down and met Chatar Singh. And both of them learned from each other. And they both called me later individually to tell me how much that kind of thing had happened. And it's just, I mean, I just happened to see parallels and to connect them. But I just, I'm just hoping that in that kind of sense, there is some help that I can, I can, you know, for, as a third person, um, be to, to communities in various ways. Um, like, especially with the, with the tiger widows that I write about, we are trying to do something where, uh, we're addressing the mental health of tiger widows, which is very, very hard. So I'm, while, I should not intervene for story purposes. I do not actually intervene. There are things that we can do where um, you just kind of make things happen so that there is a different, I don't let the humanitarian part of it, uh, I don't hold back on the humanitarian part of it. I, I don't, of course, change the story for it, but um, there are people that I'm working with so that I can tell them and allow them to come up and make their own um, little cohort that they can help these uh, tiger widows with uh, in terms of mental health and so on. So it's more like kind of removed support, but uh, making sure that there is something, at least if nothing is changing from the government side, then at least that there is some self-help happening uh, in terms of improving situations. It's not ideal and uh, I don't have good answers for it, uh, but that's what it is. Any other questions, guys? Sorry to make you walk, but uh, apparently that's actually not not a not a deep question. Firstly, congratulations, loving the book, Thank somewhere you. midway through it now. Thank Just you. got reading, beautiful. And uh, Arti, what you bring alive through your uh, way of writing, your style, your sketches, the photography, the poetry. Uh, the whole storytelling, I think, comes together beautifully. Thank you. Uh, and yet there are components. I mean, knowing you, some aspects that I think are still missing. There is your ability to take videos, the time-lapse series that you do so beautifully, and sitting here listening to your art of storytelling, your voice, and the voice modulation that really brings the story alive. Do you see margin lands being adapted to another medium? And how soon should we look out for something like that? <laughs> soon and all, I don't know. But uh, definitely one of the things that Tista and I had talked about is that, uh, see, these stories aren't over. They're still unfolding. So um, I definitely wanted it to be like a living book. So it will have some kind of component where the storytelling will continue. And definitely with, uh, uh, thank you for saying that about voice modulation, but I have been wondering, you know, how we can bring uh, sounds yeah. 
soundscapes, because every one of these landscapes is a different soundscape, even within the landscape. And it's so rich. It's a different level. Uh, it's a different layer of information. So um, in the work that I do in the future, in the transect, for example, that is going to be a big part of it. Sound will be a big part of it. So there will be different um, ways of storytelling. Uh, margin lands itself, probably, I don't know. I mean, it'll depend upon the powers that be if they're interested. Uh, but uh, in terms of my own storytelling, absolutely, I'm going to be exploring uh, feature films as well as uh, as uh, uh, sound and soundscapes to add that level of that layer, another layer. Thank you, Shiralu, for this. Anyone else? Thanks for the presentation. I haven't read the book. I heard about it only 20 minutes ago. I mean, just I just happened to wander in. So it was very sure. uh, nice. To Thank you for wandering in. Yes. Thank yes, you. Yes, yes, yeah. Yes. <laughs> but I'm a, I'm, I'm, so anyway, a very quick uh, thing that, see, this Ladakh, you know, there's nothing that the people there can really do about the fear. It's a much bigger phenomenon. But at least the other two, and, and Thar also, I think it's, a, they only learned to manage it. But the other two, maybe there are some uh, cause or a chain of things which they have theoretically some control over. So is there any example of uh, large interventions in the land which have actually succeeded and stabilized and allowed humans to sort of, like the Netherlands or something, I mean, where, you know, large part of it is reclaimed under, under sea and for at least many decades or many even a few hundred years has actually survived while seriously inter interfering with, you know, the natural flow of things and so on. So are there any examples where uh, in a sort of slower and controlled way, we are actually able to modify the environment in a um, way that we would like to without all these concepts? Because of the examples that you gave, it seems that almost any big intervention, you cannot foresee all the things that are going to happen downstream. And one should just not do very big things at all. I mean, because there are just too many connections with which we cannot anticipate. So... Uh, thank you for that question. Um, so in terms of the big things and anticipating, it's interesting, many of these big things have always had people sounding uh, alarm bells and giving very good reasons for why it should not be done. Uh, question always remained as to whether anybody listened and mostly they didn't. Uh, so in fact, with Faraka also, there was there, was, there have been papers written on why this shouldn't be done and how it could have been done uh, differently. And uh, just nobody listened because there was... There were people, the union minister at that time was very pro-irrigation uh, and intervention through dams and so on, whatever. Uh, but in terms of your other question, there are, uh, it's, it doesn't involve concrete, my examples, don't Im involve the material concrete. But I do know of wonderful efforts being done where people have uprooted the existing landscape to return it to what it must have been like in its native state. There has been an intervention that caused a problem, and now the eco-restorers are returning the land to how it used to be, and it is stable. That is how it is. Nothing is, it's, it doesn't require constant intervention. One example for is, uh, is Raujodha Park, which is just below Mehrangad. Mehrangad fought uh, the, um, the uh, the Maharaja there in the 30s, I believe, he wanted to green the place. So he seeded the whole area with uh, Prosopis juliflora, which is a very invasive plant, took over the whole place. And now all over Deccan, all over India, you have this tree, which is just uh, a scourge. But uh, one man, his vision, Pradeep Krishan, he uprooted, he had Kalbelias, uproot, uh, not Kalbelias, forget the name now, anyway, they uh, uprooted uh, the pl plant by plant, tree by tree, they uprooted the whole region um, just below Mehrangad Fort and painstakingly he went and found seeds of grasses, seeds of plants which are native, which grow in the desert, brought it back, planted it and today Rao Jodha Park is a thriving native 
land of how the um, Jodhpur desert must have looked like. And it is fabulous. There is wildlife coming back to it. There are migratory birds coming. This is, it's a wonderful region and self-sustaining. You don't have to do anything to it. Uh, uh, two other friends of mine have been returning degraded land in the Anamalais uh, to uh, rainforests. And uh, so they're preserving, they're, they're reforesting, but in a way that is correct, ecologically viable and uh, sustainable. And so there are these uh, eco restorers uh, that are doing things the right way and uh, which basically just doing things right by the land. And it is working. Very often, uh, something that works, say, in Israel, in the desert, in the Negev desert, or in the Netherlands, if you think to transplant it here, will it work here, and you know those kinds of things, you'll run into problems because our rivers are different, our rocks are different, our mountains are different. And then if you just try to do the same thing, our deserts are different. Um, it's not going to work. You are eventually going to have. But if you listen to what should have been there, what has been there for years and eons, and you try to bring that back, you are going to succeed. I do hope you you uh, enjoy the book. Thank you, sir, for coming in. Yes. Hi. Uh, you mentioned about this point a little bit uh, in your talk about education and um, I have a young kid and uh, you know even in our education system what I find is um, there are subjects there's uh, first I think the humanities is probably I feel not that taught or emphasized as much as it should be. The second thing I feel is uh, the interconnectedness of different things is not taught. For example if you if you read about history if you read about the uh, Central American um, uh, kingdoms or even if you uh, read about Angkor Wat, uh, they have had extensive systems of terraforming, harvesting the land. And one of the reasons, or even like uh, the Indus Valley, closer to home, uh, they did all of this and still due to climate change, uh, probably, um, um, you know, diverting the rivers, harvesting the land, uh, they did a bit too much, they grew too fast. And uh, what we see in history is the rise and fall of dynasties. And we see something else in geography, but we never connected, connect yes. each of these. Mm -hmm. Do you see that as a problem in some of these not uh, uh, affecting, in some sense, eventually policy, because all of these children You're and all of us grew up and yes. never interconnect the dots? You're absolutely right. So one of the things that I think I make a point of in the book, I hope I do, is that we live in silos. And our uh, modern civilization is so specialized that one, speciali uh, one specialist is great at what he or she does, but doesn't speak to another specialist who is also great at what he or she does, and these things affect one another. So for example, in India, traditionally, hydrologists have not spoken to sociologists, sociologists have not spoken to the doctors, doctors have not spoken to um, the uh, urban planners, and therefore there are these silos and things get done where um, you're not, uh, the, the interconnections are missed. You're absolutely right. And I think the, um, the interdisciplinary way of thinking, the systems thinking has been missing. And we need to get back to that. And I really, really feel bad when I hear uh, kids also today and how they, how they learn. Because um, I have people living, so I live in a gated community. And there are people who, um, who put things up, you know, and messages and so on. And uh, often I see messages where people are saying there are parasites on the tree, this tree is dying, it needs to be sprayed, etc. And uh, you go and see what it is, is it's a caterpillar. This caterpillar will turn into a butterfly, which they love, but they haven't made that connection. So very, very basic things. It goes back to the question that Prem asked earlier about disconnection. And the more we specialize, the more tunnel vision we have, the more disconnected we are from the interconnections of everything. And I really wish that uh, the children uh, go out for a walk once in a while and uh, take in how everything is connected, you know, the water with the plant, with the uh, animals that feed on the plant and everything. Um, how, how water flows down from the river or from the building even, you know, into your uh, lake, uh, what, what the lake does. 
everything. And uh, that kind of um, education is sorely missing today. And it, unless we tackle that part and teach the child survival skills, um, we will not be reversing this anytime soon. Because again, you know, you're con co continuously going to have the engineers thinking one way, the ecologists thinking another way. And if the two don't collaborate, if they don't come together to build a city, uh, you're going to have problems. So I think one of the uh, chapters, I think I begin with that, where, you know, instead of the engineers, uh, it's I think Douglas's uh, uh, quote, uh, instead of engineers, if you could give the cities to geologists and botanists and, um, but even in that, I feel it's not just the botanists. The botanists will only see the trees. The geologists will only see the rocks. They need to come together. They need to talk to each other and they need to be able to see things as the land. You know, the land is not any one thing. So that really needs to happen, especially in, uh, in our cities. And I think India has a wonderful opportunity for that right now. And as Harni Nagendra once said, the, the smaller cities, in fact, have pretty good assemblages of these things. You know, you can still save these cities and make them truly smart and, uh, and uh, resilient. And I think we in India, in spite of having this population, we have such a wonderful opportunity to, uh, to make things uh, right and restore ecosystems to make them work. But it all requires uh, looking beyond uh, silos. Um, one last comment, I think. Um, it would be lovely to see Margin Lands as a documentary. And, I, uh, and if, if, if it's a possibility to maybe even crowdfund it, that would be lovely. Thank you so much, I, I hope. <laughs> Just because you're shake, you don't get to ask from there. <laughs> so hey, Aarti, congratulations. Thanks. I wanted to hear about your new project. You have mentioned a transect. Um, thanks to a grant from National Geographic uh, Society, I am going to be documenting what happens after this kind of degradation to the land, what happens to the people, this migration, this pinballing across India. Um, and, and what does it take? It's not easy for these people to up and leave, you know? It takes a lot. They're gonna leave their wife, their children behind. It's mainly male out migration. And the wives and the children, the, the, the women left behind, the children left behind, how they live, uh, that is not easy either. So, you know, going to the next level beyond the environmental degradation to see what it is that we are losing. They lose agency, they lose identity when they move. And what does that then mean for the future of India? Um, so I'm going to try and um, tease that out by doing a transect. I'm going to be moving through from the easternmost point of India, um, that's on the China border, all the way to Kutch, uh, so from the rainforest to the salt pan, so to speak, uh, but moving um, with and as the locals move. So I'm not going to be in a car or anything, but maybe take a boat or a bus or, a, you know, however people move, um, maybe on the tops of uh, buses, however people move, um, and try to document um, both the aspirations as well as uh, the, the pain uh, that it might take to, to up and leave um, from their native lands and the cost, therefore. Thank you. People? Yeah. Yeah, please. Um, I had a simpler question. You, um, you're traveling the length and breadth of this country. Um, how do you deal with language? How do you communicate without using nuance, do you almost ha always have a local translator with you? How does that work? How do you start a project? Um, yeah, so that is, uh, in, in a place like India, that's always a struggle. Uh, it's, it really helps to have very good translators, people who have um, more than just uh, you know, language sense. They kind of also know uh, literature of the place. Mm, they know. Uh, the, they know the social structure, the milieu, and so on. I have I've been in, 
incredibly lucky uh, in finding such people in um, in Bengal, for example. But I'm also beginning to learn the language. Uh, that's something that I try. I'm trying to do because I work a lot there. So my Bengali is very rudimentary, but it gets much better when I'm left all alone in the Sundarbans. You know, I have to fend for myself, and then it gets better. And I've been able to um, talk, but I also tape uh, a lot. So I record everything so that I can always come back and hear it from good people who can translate well exactly what was said. So that's something that has really helped me. And um, um, also having great translators, like Prem, for example, played translator in Kerala for me. And oh my God, if only all translators were like Prem. Is that a job of? It Sounds like a good sort of uh, place to end this evening with. So, ladies and gentlemen, please give it up for. Thank you so much.